So what I have on the bench here is some parts out of a car. These are from a 2005 Toyota Corolla. All right, so we're over here at the car and this is the driver's side seat in the car and everything mounts up here underneath the seat. And you pull one of these to, to open the trunk and you pull the other one to open the fuel door. Basically this piece here is oriented like this. Here's where the bolt was. And so imagine that in this position. And if I show you down here, you can see I left the bolt in place where that bolt's up to. I, I think we can make this part with 3D printing. Yeah, it's gonna be challenging. There's a lot to this. That looks great. I think it's time to start assembling this guy and then see if it fits. It works and it works perfectly. Uh, fuel door and trunk open without any issues. Nothing feels like it's flexing, nothing is binding up. I am really happy with this so far. I mean, I'm gonna leave the trim off of here for probably a month or two just to make sure that this guy does continue to work correctly since this is a bit of a pain to get off. But yeah, I'm calling this done. Hey guys and welcome to Functional Print Friday and welcome back to my shop. So it was done for about a year and a half. Actually just got the car back from the mechanic. It was there for the yearly safety inspection that's required here in Pennsylvania and came back broken. So I don't know if the tech maybe stepped on this getting in or out of the car or was just a little heavy handed with either the trunk or the fuel release, but either way, it's broken. And you know, I could blame it on a lot of different things, but the reality is I think our 3D printed part that we made a year and a half ago is not as strong as the original factory part. So let's get this apart and see what actually failed on here. So these prongs here were actually broken before. There was only one of these remaining, but it seemed pretty stable, so I went with it. And it looks like that didn't fail us. But I think this is supposed to be attached, if I recall. Yeah, so this part was definitely attached here. It's a little bit difficult to see where it broke off, I think just because there's grease on the part there. And I can very clearly see where this one broke off. You can see the patch there. You can see the, uh, the white marks on the plastic where it was stressed. So it looks like that broke off at a layer line. Although it doesn't feel perfectly smooth. It might have grabbed some of the material from another layer. And we can see a little bit of the white stress mark that the grease hasn't sort of wetted against it uh, right there. I notice there's also a spot here where it looks like maybe I had a mistake in the original design. That looks like it was kind of pushing up against uh, that cutout for that steel reinforcing bar that runs underneath the, the seat. Looks like we were rubbing up against that. I mean, it didn't break there, but I can see that we probably do need to adjust the design a little bit in that spot. And this was printed in Hatchbox ABS. Yeah, this is the material this was done in just Hatchbox ABS. This is the best material I had to do this in at the time because this had to be highly temperature resistant since it is in a car. It gets well over 100 degrees in there while it's parked. And I'm just realizing we should have, we should have two of these springs. Yeah, there's actually two little perches here for springs I think I took the one off of this side just now. So we're missing one on this side, which makes sense because without this stop, this would have been able to rotate uh, to the point where that spring would just fall right off. I wonder if that's still in the car. It's actually the second time in only a couple of weeks that this thing has saved me. I'll put a link down in the description to this guy again. All right, well, I think we have recovered all of the pieces. So 
let's analyze how this failed. This actually has some depth to it here. This looks like this might have ripped off at two different layer lines, but it definitely did fail um, on the layer lines. Yeah, and this is totally flat where it broke off, so that failed on the same layer for all of those different walls. All right, I grabbed the microscope. Let's take a closer look at where these parts actually failed. Okay, so this is the surface that that barrel-shaped piece was attached to, and that looks like that all cleanly broke off at a single layer, and the white stress marks would have been from where the plastic was most strongly attached. Interesting that we have these large gaps. I'm not sure why that is the case. I was kind of expecting to see uh, more white stress marks sort of all the way across here. Uh, but those gaps kind of make it look like, well, I wonder if we had a good extrusion on the other side of this part. I mean, the extrusion on this face looks really good. I don't see any significant gaps here. But I'm seeing it looks like one, two, three, four, five walls and they all just ripped off cleanly. Uh, the other stuff that's on here is, I believe just grease. Yeah, this is just grease from when I assembled it. But yeah, all the way around, looks like that ripped off at just one layer. Let's look at the, let's look at the barrel piece that was on here. Okay, so here's that barrel. And well, I see why we had gaps on the other piece in the white stress marks. This looks like this was pretty significantly under extruded in some areas. I mean, we have really good consistent extrusion for all five walls over here, but then we get down into this area here and you can see, I mean, that's a pretty significant gap. I mean, we're essentially missing the contact patch of at least one full wall. But yeah, I mean, this clearly ripped off at a single layer. So I think layer adhesion just wasn't strong enough for this part. Let's take a look at the other piece. Okay, so here's the other piece that ripped off. And one thing I'm noticing right away is these lines are running a different direction from these lines down here. So I think we're actually seeing more than one layer here. Yeah, for sure. Like up, up in this upper portion up here, that's definitely a separate layer than this layer here. And I think this is a separate layer from this layer up here as well. I'm not sure what's going on over here. This is probably the seam on the part. All right, here's the face that that piece broke off from, and we can clearly see from this side that, yeah, this did actually fail at, looks like maybe three different layers, because we have our outer walls over here, then a layer underneath that, and then a layer underneath that, I believe. So this actually failed at three different layers. I, I think it got pushed off from this side. So this is a stop for both of those, uh, both of those handles. So I think it probably had force on it in this direction and it just ripped off this face and it actually rotated on this axis over here, which would explain why we ripped down into a couple different layers on this side. So our failure originally started with still just these three outer walls over here and that part levering off. So yeah, I think the ABS let us down with the layer strength. Well guys, I'm not quite sure what to do next. I do have a couple different ideas of how we can potentially strengthen this part without affecting any of the external dimensions. Because uh, we are pretty much tied to those dimensions, especially on this side, uh, as well as all of the dimensions and the relief inside here for this barrel. Uh, both of these, so this one actually fits over that barrel. It sort of rotates in that bore. So, like, we don't even have room to add a chamfer down to the bottom. I know that would strengthen. It would bias probably another wall, but there isn't room for it. And then this guy actually rotates on the inside of this bore. Now, this side over here, we could modify this. It mounts against this flat face here and this face along the top here. So anything that is underneath that face below it, we do actually have room to modify. Just imagine there's a line that runs from here at an angle down to here. So anything sort of that lives in this space underneath this face, we could modify, but I mean, it didn't break there. So I don't know that that really buys us a whole lot of options. We could also reduce the size of this pocket. I noticed taking it apart that the spring doesn't really need all that room uh, to rotate on the axis up here. The original part from Toyota actually had an even bigger pocket here, but we don't need it. We can size that down. So, you know, if we wanted to, to thicken the part up over here, we could do that 
and that does live on the other side of here. But again, it didn't, it's not like this broke off here. It failed just on the face up here. So it doesn't matter how thick we make it on this face. It doesn't really buy us any strength on this side. So I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say. Now, I think one thing we can definitely change is the material. Uh, the best material I had at the time to make this was just plain old ABS. And I think that was a great choice from a temperature perspective and was plenty strong everywhere else. Like I was actually kind of worried about these guys. This is where those cables click into that have like ceramic ends and then the cable pulls from those. I was worried that would break. That held up perfectly fine. I don't see any stresses in the material there at all. So I think we've just got to figure out how to solve for those two things. So I'm really curious to see down in the comments what ideas you guys have for potentially modifying this to strengthen it. Let me go grab all of the filaments that I have accumulated since we last made this one out of just plain old ABS because I'm also really curious to hear what you guys think is the best material to reprint this out of. I mean, clearly temperature resistance is important since this is going in a car, but ABS did just fine. So I think any material that has temperature resistance, at least as good as ABS, we know will work. But knowing that this guy primarily failed on layer adhesion, I think a material that has better layer adhesion, at least than ABS, is probably a good start. Let me go grab what I have. All right, we've got PAHTCF, which I believe is nylon. I think PPSCF is also nylon. This is an interesting one. This is ABS with polycarbonate. I'm not really too familiar with this. Uh, PA12, this is another nylon. I believe that means 12% carbon fiber. PA6CF, so I think that is 6% carbon fiber, also still nylon, polycarbonate. PAHTGF, which is actually says right on it, 15% glass fiber reinforced high temperature nylon. So this is the only one that is glass reinforced. And Ultra PA, which, yeah, that also says right on here, unfilled high temperature nylon. And being nylon without any additives, this is probably pretty flexible, especially for some of the thin areas in that model, like where that barrel attaches down to the base, but probably also has the best layer adhesion. I'm sitting here editing tonight's video and I got to the point where I was talking about all of the different engineering filaments that we could possibly make this from. And I thought, you know what, let me pop up the Bamboo Labs website and just see if anything new has come out that is worth ordering because Bamboo usually takes a little bit longer to get stuff to me than Amazon. So if I want it by, you know, time to print it for next week's video, I probably need to order it like now or tomorrow. And they've actually got a pretty big sale going on right now for their engineering filaments. Uh, it looks like everything's 35% off. Uh, I'll admit, I don't know if these are the normal prices that they have crossed out here or if they inflated them before the sale like I know some companies do. But then I went over and I looked at the printers. Now, when I opened the printers page, I was a bit surprised because I do know, at least in US dollars, the prices of these printers pretty well. Because running a YouTube channel for 3D printing, a lot of people ask me what printer I would recommend that they get for themselves or for their kit. And I know that $699 is the regular price for the P1S. So I thought maybe they really did inflate the price to some artificial higher amount here before their sale. But I realized that the, the pull downs here all defaulting to the combo were available. So this machine is actually $499 right now, at least here in the US. I, I imagine this sale is, is worldwide, but I'm not familiar with the, the prices outside of the United States. Um, so that means the X1C is actually $9.99 just by itself. Now, I mean, the combo is nice to have, but if you don't want to do multicolor stuff, you really don't need it on either one of these machines since you're not really going to do multiple materials, like different materials on either one of these machines. And these are the two that I recommend the most to people right up here at the top. Uh, the A1 is probably, well, actually the A1 and the P1P are two that I really wouldn't recommend. I think the build volume on the A1 is just a little bit too big for a bed slinger. As you get heavier, taller prints on this machine, you really lose a lot of print quality at the top. And especially this guy being, let's see, what's this? This is 339 for just a bare printer. I mean, I know there is a price difference that is a bit substantial between those two if you're, if you're on a budget, but I, I wouldn't bother with this one. Save up and get the P1S. Uh, same thing for the P1P. You're literally spending $100 less for an unenclosed machine 
that I think has a few other features that are lesser than the P1S as well. And if you're looking for the most budget-friendly machine possible, the A1 Mini at 219 is not a bad deal. I think I have seen these as cheap as 199 in the past, but 219 is not a bad price for this. And this doesn't suffer from the same problem with really tall build volume because, well, just the volume of the machine itself is not that large and it's actually pretty rigid. So if you're looking to just kind of dip your toe in the water and see what the Bamboo Lab ecosystem is like, it's not a bad machine to get started with. I'll put a link down in the description to my personal favorite as a starter machine, and that'll be the P1S. So we're gonna stop here this week because now that you guys know how the part failed and what materials I have here to work with, I'm really curious to hear what you guys think I should reprint this in. And if you don't think the right choice is up here, that's fine too, just let me know down in the comments. If you're suggesting a filament that's not already on the bench, uh, I do need to hear about it probably by maybe Tuesday next week at the latest, so I have time to actually get it here to print the part for next week's video. If you've got any questions, put those down in the comments as well, and I'll do my best to answer them. And again, what I'm looking for from you guys is a recommendation on what filament I should use to reprint this in and any design changes that you might suggest, keeping in mind that we pretty much have to keep with the existing external dimensions of the part, save for that one area on the back where we can make some changes. And I'll make sure that the STL for this part is linked down in the description of the video. So if you want to download it, check it out kind of get an idea for what might work, what might not work, feel free to do that. And if this is by chance your first time here on the channel, thanks for tuning in. This is all we do here. It's all the engineering related to 3D printing and the functional aspect of 3D printing. So parts that fix stuff, parts that add functionality to things or just from scratch designs for out here in the shop, outside or around the house. If you enjoyed the video, please take a second and hit that like button. It really helps out the channel and check out some of the other videos on the channel as well. And if you like what you see, hit the subscribe button. And guys, if you do, I'll see you next Friday.